and it wasn't until the 1970s before the NDP started to influence government under the leadership of Grant Notley. There was a, a certain optimism in 1971 when Grant got elected. We thought we were on the road to, to glory at that time. Just the uh, absolute dedication. I mean, imagine what it's like. Uh, you get elected, and that was exciting for when you got elected in 71. But, you know, election after election after election, he was the only one there. Most other people would have quit. You know, they wouldn't be able to take the, the rejection time and time and time again. But uh, not Grant Nautley. It was a lonesome uh, job with him for many years, but uh, because he was able, because unions like even the uh, uh, government workers uh, saw him as a spokesman, and would sometimes leak information to him. Uh, he became, by most uh, political commentators, the most effective member in the legislature. Grant never quit being a public servant, ne never quit being a uh, crusader. He always had something on his mind that wanted done. So when you met him, either in a small group or in a larger group, he had a message and he had a call for you, call to action. We're gaining ground all the time, there's no doubt about that. I think uh, what we see is a government that's carrying on an energy war with Ottawa. One of the most notable battles Notley fought was his attempt to bring more revenue to the province. He led the charge against the federal government to have Alberta hold more control over its own resources, with the focus on creating employment and increasing revenues through the development of Alberta's oil sector. The uh, provincial income wasn't really uh, matching uh, the revenues they were expending. They had a deficit of about uh, $500 million, which was about two years of budget at the time or something like that. And uh, we came up with the idea, we got these tar sands, let's develop it ourselves type of thing. We'll uh, make all kinds of money and balance the budget or we'll, and we'll change the oil royalties to get more. The era also saw the party lead the way in gender equality. The Women's Caucus was formed in 1979 to promote participation and education of women and women's issues within the party. It was a natural follow-up to the work that began more than a decade earlier by Mary Reimer. To be with women who thought like you did yourself, it was so much more comfortable to be someplace where you had voice and you got respect, and you could do something. You could put in place, like be active and, and participate in policy development. We just really, really uh, are here to support other women, and that's where they should come if they want, want to, uh, and to get together even in their own groups, you know, really. And I can sort of see it happening right now. There are uh, two or three young women right now, for instance, that are sort of active. And uh, I'm thinking, yes, yes, go, go do it. <laughs> Notley was a one-man band in the legislature until 1982 when Ray Martin joined him to form the official opposition. Tonight I gained a friend in Ray Martin in the Alberta legislature. <laughs> Together, there will be no doubt, no dispute by fair-minded people that with the NDP running second throughout the province of Alberta as the only recognized and organized provincial party that we are clearly the official opposition in the next Legislative Assembly. I think when Ray came on, um, there was uh, some feeling that, that uh, the NDP uh, was an alternative to the Conservatives. You know, it was uh, at least there was somebody to pound the desk with, <laughs> you know, when he made speeches, but I think we were very good at opposition for two people. Then a plane crash changed the political landscape forever. That uh, day we were in the legislature, the session was on, and Grant and I had lunch. And uh, he, uh, uh, th there was a party meeting after, 
and uh, so he didn't think he was going to be going home till the next morning, Saturday morning, and. Uh, that's you know the last I saw of him was at uh, lunch and we had the legislature and then of course uh, about 11 I think it was about 11 o'clock I got a call from uh, uh, Peter Lougheed's office premier's office uh, Bob Giffen saying was Grant on that plane and I said uh, I didn't think so uh, because you know he wasn't going out till the next morning then about uh, 7 o'clock uh, in the morning, uh, I got another call. And they said, uh, yeah, they found out that Grant was on the plane. And they knew that, uh, that some people had lived and some had uh, not uh, made it through, but they didn't know who. And then about 11 o'clock, uh, they called me and uh, uh, they said they had some bad news and Grant was uh, one of the people that was killed. Well, that was just uh, awful. You know, I just went to practically berserk after until my wife Cheryl said, you've got to get your act together and go down and deal with the media. And Ross Harvey had set that up. So uh, it was a, a very difficult time for me. It was a difficult time for the party. Grant's death rocked the party and left a giant void. We will never fill the vacuum that he has left. But we find what comfort we can, Mr. Speaker, in the sure knowledge that Grant Notley will live in the hearts and minds of all people of goodwill. We extend to his wife and his three children our deepest sympathy and regrets. We shall not see his like again. And it was a devastating news. I remember I, on uh, that day, uh, it, um, I remember his, uh, that was a shock, you know, when we heard the news of the plane going down and uh, Grant dying. Then a few days later, within a week, I guess, there was a big memorial service for him at All Saints Cathedral. And I was teaching uh, that afternoon. As soon as I finished my lecture, we rushed there. I had a couple of other friends with me, uh, colleagues. Uh, we come there, and there's a line up to go in, uh, extending all the way to Hudson's Bay, you know, the, 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 on that street. There's no room to go in. So we outside, and I saw people sobbing and crying and all of that. So it is such an emotional impact on people. I'm sure all MLAs and Albertans wish to express to his family their very deep appreciation for the dedicated public service of Grant Notley. The province, after Grant's death, literally went into mourning. Grant would have been amazed because here this guy had struggled just to get elected each time and finally I had joined him. But the province, people had learned to respect him so much, including Peter Lougheed, including the Conservatives, and Peter Lougheed, I give him great credit for the way he, you know, he helped us out during that time, you know, with the plane bringing NDP luminaries in. But Grant had become a, 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 a tradition almost in the province, that no matter how much they voted conservative overwhelmingly, but they always felt so sort of secure that they had this one guy standing there giving a, a, an alternative view of Alberta. And I think that, that people respected him for that. And, and when he was gone, there was absolute shock in the province. We're going to keep on walking forward. Keep on walking forward. Keep but the party had to move on and continue the work Notley had set in motion. We got through it because of the, of, of the commitment that we had seen from Grant. I mean, when you're as committed to the ideals of social democracy as Grant was, uh, even a tragedy as great as losing the man himself uh, was not going to daunt us uh, from pursuing that and making sure that we continue to drive forward. Uh, Grant represented ideals that were greater than Grant. Uh, as much as he represented them passionately and, and phenomenally, we all knew that uh, within each one of us there was a contribution that we could make, not only could make, but had to make, to make this province a better place and, and make, this, uh, make this world more representative of what we wanted it and thought it could be. The fact that he had 
left a, a sort of a legacy of political integrity, uh, political militancy, uh, a dream of transforming Alberta politics. Uh, it came into fruition after his death. The first step was to win the by-election for Notley's seat. That job fell to Jim Gurnett. We had uh, uh, thought that we'd lost our leader and we'd never find another one that would be comparable. And uh, it, it hurt everybody. And there was, a, there was a great deal of depression in the party. Uh, but with the uh, uh, Grant seat being held in Spirit River Fairview in the next election, we lost a little bit of that negativity and, and uh, moved on and I think continued to build even though we had some ups and downs. Well, I, that was huge uh, for us to uh, win that by-election. And, uh, uh, you know, Grant had always just squeaked through, so we were very uneasy about it. Uh, but as it turned out, we couldn't have asked for a, a better candidate than, uh, than Jim Garnett. He completely understood the need for community, and that was, that played a, a big role in, in shaping the party in those years after Grant's death. Never turning back. The next election showed the NDP was a force in provincial politics. With a conservative government falling out of favor, the party collected 30% of the vote and won 16 seats. So we had a year of uh, stature building of us and Grant conservatives that were unpopular for, well, recessionary times or something. And by a small increase in votes, 16 seats flipped over and we became the official opposition. I, I think we're all a little surprised. Uh, you know, Grant, uh, I, I remember talking to him. He said, I want, really want to give this last election. That would be the, you know, the 86 election a good shot because after that I'm probably going to step down, he told me this, it would probably run federally in the Peace River because Jed Baldwin was stepping down. And uh, uh, he, uh, so that sort of was in the back of his mind, but if we'd won the 16, I think he probably would have stayed. The group of 16 pushed the government on several issues, but one member found the national spotlight by forcing government to accept French in the legislature in what would be dubbed the Piquette Affair. Leo didn't uh, uh, start off to make this uh, uh, an issue. He just thought it was common sense. He would just uh, ask one question, because uh, Nancy, it was, I think it was to Nancy Bitkowski at the time, uh, and she understood French. And so he just thought that would you know, be, he represented the Francophone area, just one quick question. And of course, the speaker, uh, David Carter at the time, wrote it out of order. And, uh, and from there, it became a national issue. He, I think, um, reminded us that we have another culture to think about. And in Alberta, sometimes that doesn't happen. 